Welcome to Eggshell Transformations, a podcast for intense people. My name is Imi, and I'm here with you on a journey. Hi, everyone. I'm sharing with you today a conversation that I really, really love. Kayla is a YouTuber and a psychotherapist in training. She has a beautiful channel called On The Line on YouTube. After receiving her own diagnosis, she set out to educate others about this often misunderstood mental disorder. There are many psychologists and experts who talk about BPD online, but I was drawn to Kayla and wanted to talk to her because she is so open and clear in how she presents information and because she has a very unique journey of having had BPD and is now on her way to become a psychotherapist. So we talked about many topics that are not often discussed publicly, such as what is quiet BPD, what are the subtypes of BPD, is borderline personality disorder a diagnosis or an identity, can you become a therapist when you have BPD, and, and then I went off a bit on the BPD empathy paradox. I think it's a misconception that people with BPD lack empathy, and I'll explain why I think that. You can tell I was really engaged throughout this whole conversation. I feel so blessed to be able to share Kayla's journey with you. I hope you'll get something from this. Thank you. Hi, Kayla. Welcome so much. It's lovely to have you. Thank you. Thank you for having me this morning. Yes. So I saw you on YouTube and I thought that I admire how open you are. And you talk about things about especially borderline personality disorder that not a lot of people talk about. And you also talk about it from a very unique dual perspective, because I know you had it and you share very openly about your personal experience, which we will talk about, but you also have the clinical knowledge as someone in training. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. So if that's okay with you, can you introduce a bit more of yourself to our audience and tell us a bit more about you and personality disorder and what propelled you to do this work? Sure. So yeah, essentially I am finishing up my master's. I'm actually done in a couple of weeks and then oh, I'll be, congratulations. yeah, <laughs> thank you. So I'll be a psychotherapist uh, here in Canada. And as, what propelled me, I think for the longest time, I've always had an interest in helping people. Originally, I was thinking of being a teacher and throughout my teacher training, I just kind of had the thought that, you know what, what I enjoy the most is spending that one-on-one -on -one time with students. And so how can I transform that into a career? And I think that along the way, when I got my own diagnosis, I realized really the importance of being in this field and helping others because with, with BPD, it's, it can feel very alienating at times. And to have a therapist who has firsthand experience, what a wonderful gift. And that's what propelled me to go on this journey of creating my YouTube channel, of getting my master's degree so I could be a therapist in the domain. And it's led me to incredible opportunities along the way to meet a lot of interesting people, to learn so much more about myself. And I'm really grateful for where life has taken me because of all of this mm. and I bet it's so rare that you get someone who would openly say yes I've experienced it too yeah exactly and have it can be tricky any, have you met anyone who admitted that uh, to that apart from Marshall there like, was what, like there that? was one <laughs> yeah, there was one other person uh in my program uh, during my master's program um, but we didn't have any classes together. So once I had kind of posted, we had a shared Facebook group and I had posted my first YouTube video on there to get the message out there. Someone else commented on it saying that they also had BPD, but I've never actually met anyone in person who has had an open dialogue with me about being a therapist, but also having dealt with uh, disorder in the past. I know anxiety and depression are things, are things I hear all the time because they're not as stigmatized. But with BPD, really, I have yet to meet someone that we can talk about it openly. Exactly. Yeah. I think all mental health is a little bit stigmatized, but yes, BPD and personality disorder is a spectrum particularly. Yeah. So thank you so much for your courage and openness, what I give to the world. And I do believe... 
the level of your reward is proportionate to the level of risk you take. So yes. I have no doubt it's worth it in the end. Mm. Absolutely. And like I said, I've already noticed so many benefits in my own life and I can only imagine where mm. things are going to take me and the impact that this will hopefully have on others' lives. It's actually really amazing to be able to live so congruently, isn't it? It's just, just to come out as who you are rather than to hide the parts of your past. Mm-hmm. It was really scary at first. And I think it was something that I thought about for quite a while. Mm. Just knowing the field that I'm going into and putting myself out there so publicly, there's definitely a fear of mm. how is this going to impact my career? Mm. Um, how will I be perceived by other professionals, by potential clients who run into my channel. Um, but having weighed the risk, I think that I ultimately I decided it was, there was more benefits that would derive from this than not. Yes. And so that's what kind of led me, but it's, it's definitely still scary and something, something I think about at times, the repercussions, yes. the negative ones that it could have on my life. Out of curiosity, do you volunteer that information or do you just naturally that client comes or do you particularly work with BPB clients? So right now where I am, I'm actually working in a clinic that focuses on eating disorders. Mm -hmm. And so I was doing that for my practicum. I'll be staying there once I graduate as well. I'm not working per se with BPD clients. It's something that I've communicated that I want to do and are in my future plans. However, I will say that there are people that I see that maybe have more of sensitive traits that I can relate to. And it's easy for me to help them with my classmates at school and my professors at university. I have communicated that openly. It's not something that I'm shy to talk about in my professional setting. I think that given that I haven't been there for that long, it's not something that I've addressed uh, head on. I would say it, it's mm. in my future plans. Mm. It's also a weird thing because it can be strange in the sense that why do I need to disclose this thing that it puts us in a box almost? I don't even like using the term BPD. And I think that putting it in this closed box, it really closes off the fact that there's a variation, there's spectrums, there's multiple combinations of traits and how they present themselves and the length and et cetera, et cetera. It, it goes on. And so simply saying, oh, I have BPD it can be hard for people to conceptualize that it's so much more than what it is set out to be in the DSM. Which is what I want to come on to. Thank you for yeah. <laughs> very smoothly bridging into my first question. I'm still so interested in your story and how you do your practice now, but I think we'll cycle back to that when it comes to it. Yeah. Really wants us to start talking about the subtypes of BPD. I would like us to focus on quiet BPD, which I think is what you identify with. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But if you can quickly run through the subtypes, how they come about, maybe tell, tell, tell us a bit more about each of them. And then maybe we can have a more focused discussion about quiet BPD, which I think mm -hmm. is getting more attention now, but it, it, it's still very quiet. Mm -hmm, exactly. And so the four subtypes are not officially recognized. They're not part of the DSM. It was something that was conceptualized by Theodore Millen throughout looking at different researches and seeing patterns coming up. He kind of invented these four subtypes. And so there's two that I would say that are more externalizing and two that are more internalizing. So the two externalizing one, we have the impulsive BPD which is really the classic BPD. When we think about BPD, we think of someone who has extreme rage, maybe breaks things, throws things, very impulsive, very hot and quick. Mm -hmm. exactly. That's what we think about. So the impulsive one is more of this classical connotation that we might have of BPD. Mm -hmm. The second one that we have is the petulant one. Okay. And so with personality disorders, I'm sure that you know, but there's three different clusters and BPD falls in cluster B. And within cluster B, we also have um, antisocial personality disorder, narcissistic, and histrionic. And so the petulant subtype is really has different components or traits from narcissistic as well as histrionic personality disorder. So we see this as more of this grandiose self of entitlement. Um, we see this as this sexual promiscuity, this attention-seeking patterns, which often, again, 
kind of like the impulsive one is really associated with this classical notion that we have a BPD, someone who is attention seeking, someone who is impulsive, who doesn't think things through, who might have risky sexual relationships. That's what we think about. And then when we shift to the two internalizing subtypes, we have then the self-destructive, which is a lot of self-hate, self-blame. It does share similarities with quad BPD, but I would say that the main difference is that there's an ongoing depressive state. Mm -hmm. So folks who have this more self-destructive subtype, you would see them as having some of the BPD traits, but also categorically being depressed, having a really hard time holding down a job, doing some of the basic things like getting out of bed, taking a shower, brushing their teeth. It's more in combination with depression. And then finally, we have quad BPD, which is, again, internalizing, and it's really known as acting in rather than acting out, as I'm sure that you know. (laughs) And with quad BPD, really, there's also, we know it as high functioning. The reason being is that oftentimes with those who have quad BPD, by just looking at them, we wouldn't really know. Right. We wouldn't know because they're not throwing things around. They're not having huge fits. They're not um, maybe doing some of the things that are known as the classical BPD. And so there's the traits are more about this people problematic people pleasing. There is difficulty setting boundaries. There is a low assertiveness. There is persistent shame, self-hatred. And so all of these negative feelings are really directed towards yourself internally, mm-hmm. but not necessarily something that others can see. Yes, yes. I I really admire the way you present information. It's so systematic. I can just see boxes <laughs> and categories in your brain and they are so nicely yeah. neatly laid out. And thank you. I think that really explains it very well. Why do you think some people have learned to external sorry to internalize rather than externalizing their anger? Mm-hmm. So like everything else, I think that it's very individual. And I think that we do have genetic predispositions to having certain personality traits. When we look at the big five personality, right, you might have a predisposition to being more sensitive, to being more anxious. Mm -hmm. And those things paired with interpersonal skills that you learn from your primary caregivers is, I think, the way that we develop into specific subtypes of BPD. For example, taking my own experience, because I think that's the most relatable and easiest way to describe this, but I really learned, not only was I sensitive from the start, and also I learned from my interpersonal environment that it was actually good to suppress your emotions and to put others' needs before your own and to people please and not to speak up and to withdraw when you were feeling any, quote, negative emotions. And so over time, I picked up on those social cues to internalize all my own things. And I think that paired with also trauma that I lived growing up, I really learned that it was good to keep everything inside and that the only way to be loved was if you were overly performant. And honestly, that's what I see with not only myself, but a lot of my clients who have these traits, that they are perfectionists, that they're overachievers and high functioning because they have learned from their environment that having these very normal emotions are not acceptable and not welcomed. What might that environment be? Uh, environment? Well, you said they learn from the environment that their emotions, the normal emotions are not acceptable. And mm-hmm. I, guess, I guess that's a leading question because off the top of my head, there are some examples of these so-called environment. For example, would be if you grow up with a very narcissistic parent mm-hmm. or someone in the family is already very volatile, leaving you with no space to be emotionally expressive. Exactly. So having parents who have their own trauma, maybe mm. some of their own variants of personality yeah. traits. Yeah that make it so that, yeah, there's no room for children to express themselves, mm. uh, kids who were abused, whether physically, emotionally, sexually, whatever, whatever, in what way you were abused, you could learn in those environments that it's not safe to depend on others. Exactly. And proximity to clo- and closeness to others is actually dangerous, which is a very normal thing. It's normal to depend. It's normal to ask for your needs. It's normal to be sad and angry. But somewhere along the way, they learn that those things are unsafe. Mm. And so 
Proximity to others becomes a threat. Asking for your needs becomes a threat. Whereas in normal, quote, again, because there's no such thing as normal families, but maybe families who have more openness when it comes to emotions that have more stability and warmth and compassion, children will learn that it's okay to be sad and it's okay to ask for something and it's okay to say no and it's okay you don't need to be performant and be the best at everything to have some sort of praise and attention. And you know what? Oftentimes parents do this unintentionally. They don't even notice that they're doing it. And you don't even need big T trauma, like we call it, to develop a personality disorder. It could be small T trauma, which is just not getting your needs met in the way that you need as a child, that you pick up on that. And along the way, you become this person who internalizes and who really believes that The only way that they are worthy is if they are this perfect person all the time who gets the best grades and has all the friends and is beautiful and whatever way perfection looks like for them. And it was rewarded for the majority of their life. Exactly, exactly. Which which just reinforces the tendency again and again. Yeah. (sighs) Yeah, you're right. It's it's not that any parents intend some some do, but it's not always that the parents intentionally try to harm, but maybe they are themselves very perfectionistic mm-hmm. and, mm-hmm. and they'll have very obsessive compulsive tendencies, which can then trickle down. Maybe they were transgenerational trauma. So yeah. we're not here just, just to blame the parents, although they very often contribute to that dynamic. And I was just thinking maybe it's also partly cultural too, you know, some mm. culture encourages internalizing a lot more. Yes. And some cultures are more expressive and more tolerant of externalization. Mm-hmm. How perfect, I mean, how many people with quiet, BPD wouldn't know they have BPD do you think I mean obviously I'm not looking for statistics but (laughs) in your impression or experience that's a great question um you know what I think that a lot most people I would say at first probably don't know Mm. because it's not something that's discussed. And even when we learn about BPD at school, we learn about these classic externalizing types. And so listening to those things, it can be difficult to then identify yourself in that. If you've never then heard of BPD, which is also common that some people just simply don't know what it is, but you know what anxiety is, anxiety is not a good representation of quad BPD. Mm -hmm. And so I think it could be really hard to tell, especially if you don't even know how to make sense and you don't even really realize that there's something wrong. You just think, well, this is the way I was brought up. There's other people like me or I'm not doing anything abnormal externally. So there's nothing quote wrong with me. It could be really, really tricky at first to identify that, oh, it's not normal to be so mean to myself all the time. And it's not normal to not put boundaries and not say no and have anxiety and go in these self-hatred spirals. When you start to clue in that other people don't do that, then that's when you can start that process of, okay, let me do some digging. Let me check into this to see what's actually going on. Mm -hmm. Yes. I mean, inherent as a part of this symptomology of quiet BPD is that you're not allowed to acknowledge that you are, you, you have needs. Mm-hmm. It's, it's shameful to need help, to say you're not all right. That kind of counter-independence is a part of it. So not only that there's a lack of awareness, even though if you sense something is wrong, it might be so hard for you to acknowledge it and reach out for help. I had a question that slipped my mind. <laughs> ah, yes, I was echoing with what you were saying earlier about like even the existing therapy models like DBT are very often geared towards a lot of the externalizing behaviors. I mean, self-harm is probably uh, existing in quiet BPD too, but, but the impulsivity is not present in quiet BPD. And so I wonder if you think these therapeutic models then have limitations when it comes to quiet the quiet time or do you think they still can apply 
They definitely still apply. And I wouldn't even go as far as saying that impulsivity isn't a part of quiet BPD, because once again, I think that it's really important to move away from putting BPD and even the subtypes into these four neatly packed boxes and to say that someone is really quiet. No, someone has some of these traits and also have other moments in their lives where they might have more externalizing tendencies and that's okay. The beautiful thing with DBT is that I truly believe that it touches to all of those categories for the reason being that we learn interpersonal skills, meaning we learn how to be assertive. We learn how to ask for our needs and what our needs are and figure out what those things are independent of others. We learn how to put boundaries, which is a huge part of quad BPD. Another thing with DBT is that you learn emotion regulation. Oftentimes with quiet BPD, because you're so used to internalizing everything, it's really hard to put a finger on what you are experiencing, what the feelings are, where they're coming from, why those things are emerging. And so with DBT... analysis would be amazing, isn't it? Exactly. Exactly. And you're learning to put words on your experiences. You're learning a vocabulary for emotions, which is oftentimes not something people have with quiet BPD. I mentioned chain analysis. Can you explain a bit more to our audience what that is, if you feel ready to? Yeah, so chain analysis, essentially, no, it's okay. It's you're taking an event and then you're doing a kind of systematic analysis of, okay, what were the triggers, right? Is there emotions? Is there thoughts? Was there external things triggering me? What was the outcome? What were the feelings that were derived from that? The behaviors. And it's working your way through an experience to make sense of it and to understand where things come from, why they are emerging, where can we change the things in the chain analysis so that in future moments, if a similar occurrence happens, then we are more equipped to understand the process where we can change some parts of the change to swap it out for things that are more effective. So as a whole, it's a process of understanding from start to finish, the event, the emotions, the behaviors, Mm. the triggers, so that you can understand yourself better. And I think that's beautiful to have for people who do have quad DPD. And again, the mindfulness skills are amazing for everyone. And even distress tolerance When you have this tendency to go into these shame spirals and you're really in your head, distress tolerance skills are amazing because they get you out of your head and into your body, into activating your parasympathetic nervous system. Mm. And I always say that DBT, everyone, regardless of if you have BPD or not, could benefit from that Mm. because they're fundamental basic skills that everyone needs to know. Everyone needs to know how to make a request effectively while being intentional and not harming the other person along the way. Everyone needs to have awareness and practice mindfulness. Everyone needs to understand their emotions and make sense of triggers to know themselves better. And everyone needs to know how to be able to calm down in moments of high stress, because I don't care if you have BPD or not, you will be faced in moments where you are completely overwhelmed and don't know what to do with yourself. So I do think that obviously there are areas that it could be improved. I know with the new DBT models that are coming out, they actually added self-compassion to it. And so self-compassion is wonderful. And I think really important for those who have BPD. So yes, there are areas that it can improve, but generally speaking overall, I would say that it's great if you have quad BPD and especially if you can pair that with other kinds of therapies, like schema therapy is awesome because it gets to the root of those core beliefs that you hold about yourself. I know that there's a lot. Yeah. Yeah, Schema therapy is amazing as well. So I think that doing it kind of, if you could do the program DBT program, and then in conjunction, maybe your individual sessions are focused on the schema aspect of it. And you really learn the skills with the group, but on your own, you do more of this deep diving into yourself, that could be a great approach to tackling quad BPD. BPD. I think people can get quite lost in all these therapies. I mean, it's shocking mm. enough when you first realize you have this thing called BPD. And then yes. it's a huge discovery <laughs> to realize there's a subtype that fits you even better. And then you're faced with all these different kinds of therapies. I think it could be so confusing for people. I can tell that you're a huge fan of BBT. 
there is a new model called Auro DBT, which I quite like. Mm. And then I'm also a huge fan of schema therapy. And then there are some other ones that, for instance, in England, mentalization based therapy treatments, you know, yeah, you know of it. It's quite commonly used in the NHS. And then there's some transference based therapy. And I mean, can you speak to a bit of these models? And do you have a recommendation? Or if, if not a particular kind that you are preferring maybe what questions can people ask themselves to see what would fit so I think that you need to first of all with therapy the thing that people need to understand that the most important thing Mm -hmm. is the therapeutic relationship I agree I was gonna say (laughs) yes and so even through studies the majority of the change happens by the simple fact of having someone who accepts you unconditionally that you feel comfortable and open with that you feel truly supported so that's number one it's not even about the modalities if you find a good therapist most good therapists will have an array of modalities and will pick and choose for the moments that you're presenting them with. If you're showing up with a schema that's popping up, they will address that using schema therapy. If you're showing up with this really persistent inner critic, they might use compassion-focused therapy, right? So you'll have someone who is flexible, who is open and safe. Those are the main things to look for that can be hard and I know I'm giving these broad general strokes flexible that's quite you need a a therapist who is flexible and able to adapt to your needs Mm. picking someone who's rigid especially because we know that there is a sense of rigidity with folks who do have BPD can you illustrate that a bit more like so what would be something that they say or do or not do that would illustrate that they are rigid rather than flexible So for example, if you have a therapist who is primarily CBT, okay, just trained in cognitive behavioral therapy, that's what they do. And every time that you go to therapy and you're presenting them with a problem, they always go back to trying to change your thoughts. Okay, well, how does this make sense? And Socratic dialogue and walking you through this process of changing the thoughts. But meanwhile, what you need is just someone to listen to you, to provide you with compassion, compassion and warmth. And this therapist is so stuck in their theoretical model that doesn't maybe include this more laid back, non-directive style that it's hard for them to be there and to truly just listen. That to me seems like a therapist who would be more rigid in their ways. This is the way that we do this. This is the best way. This is the way that you will change. No. To have someone who's more flexible is open who has different tricks that they can pull from different modalities to meet you where you are in that moment with what you actually need. So when you have a hammer, everything becomes a nail and that's not cool. Exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Especially for quiet BPD. People are so used to being invalidated and to have folks not listen to them. You need therapists who are fundamentally compassionate, open, and will give you that positive regard. Thank you. Quite moved mm-hmm. hearing that. Mm-hmm. And I do think you're pointing out some very important things that I personally believe is beyond techniques. Mm-hmm. I think a lot of people come to, well, go to therapies and things and ask them for techniques and things they can do, which I can understand because you want to know what to expect and feel like you have got something that you've taken away. Mm -hmm. But I always think those are really not the most important game-changing things. Like personally for me, I know the most game-changing thing for me is really internalizing Mm -hmm. my therapist's positive regard for me and beginning Mm -hmm. to see myself as he sees me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And using your therapist as someone that allows you to form a secure relationship so that you can develop a more secure attachment with yourself. Exactly. And yes, it takes time, but it may not be as long as people, you know, if, for me, it took me more than a few years, but I think mm-hmm. it's totally worth it. A hundred percent. And it's the best investment I've ever done in myself. It's very expensive. And I recognize it's not everyone who's as fortunate as me that I can afford these things. And I know, and there are with, as time goes on, I think that we are getting more and more resources that are free or not as costly so that people have better access to mental health services. 
as a side note, as I think you might agree with me, I always passionately believe all therapists should go through their own therapy. And yes. I know that not all <laughs> trainings require that. I'm quite shocked sometimes. I mean, I understand mm-hmm. if you're doing a highly manualized therapy where it's very technique based, although I think even then you should. <laughs> When it's relational, oh my God, it's so important that we work through our own things. And yes, we will not be fixed and become completely, you know, perfect human. But it's it's really powerful when you have personally experienced it and you truly believe in it. Mm -hmm. And you can share that with clients to say, I've been through this process. When you sit down with them for the first time and you can really look them in the eyes and say, I know how scary it is to be here. It's uncomfortable to meet someone you've never met. And on top of that, you're expected to divulge your biggest traumas. That's a scary and courageous process. And knowing from a first person experience, not exactly their own experience, because you can never really understand, but having this deep empathetic understanding of I've been there myself. And this is why I like to use acceptance and commitment therapy with my own clients, Mm -hmm. because there's this concept of a shared human experience that we're all suffering at the end of the day, we're both in the same boat of being humans and suffering. And I'm here with you and I have my own struggles and I'm climbing my own mountain, even though I'm sitting in this cushy chair and you're on the couch, that doesn't mean anything. We're equals. Do you really have a couch for your clients? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not one that they lay down like the, the classic ones. Right. Yes. No, no. <laughs> oh, yeah. So here's a controversial, another slightly controversial question, which again, not very much talked about. Of course, we don't want to invalidate the suffering that comes with BPD. Definitely not. But do you think there are any quote unquote benefits or even gifts to having this disorder? Yes. Yes. And I think that most things in life that are difficult teach us important lessons. It's important to not have positive uh, or toxic positivity. Sorry. However, at the same time, I do think that with CPD, the beautiful thing is that being sensitive makes you so much more empathetic and compassionate to others. And it's a gift to be able to have this innate sensitivity to others, to also be very passionate in things that we do, because when we love, we love deeply and profoundly, and we let ourselves get carried away, whether it's by the negative emotions or the the positive ones of being in love, being grateful, Mm -hmm. it's to feel things more deeply. And for that, I'm truly grateful. And I think that with BPD, there also comes an innate resiliency that you've been able to overcome all of these challenges and you still are here today existing that's a gift that a lot of people don't get to go through and never get to that point where they know so much about themselves and have experienced so much suffering Mm. that you can take those things and become this extremely resilient in tuned empathetic compassionate caring individual I think With BPD, there's often an association as well with creativity and being uh, spontaneous, right? So that's the other side of being impulsive. I think that it makes for people who are go with the flow sometimes, who like adventures and make their lives really fun. That's beautiful. And once you start to look at the other side of the same coin for these classical BPD traits, you can start to see that no, this actually makes me outgoing and fun and deeply caring and resilient and sensitive and creative. There's a beautiful side, especially, especially when you're further along in your road to healing and you integrated. Because I think that initially when we learn that we have BPD, there's a tendency to shy away from those things and to hide and to say, I don't want those things. I don't want to be that. But when you learn to integrate your shadow the things of you that you don't like, that's when the beautiful gifts tend to come out because you've mastered both the shadow and the light. Mm. Thank you for saying it so beautifully and in Jungian terms. And yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I agree. A lot of the, sh- obviously it's a disorder. So in the symptoms are the shadows such as impulsivity. Mm-hmm. But then on that shadow, there is a light side, which is spontaneity. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. being able to be playful. And I just, 
obviously not everyone, but I really just know so many people with BPD are highly empathic. You mentioned sensitive yeah. and spontaneous, creative, artistic, and yes, resilient. But I think with the amount of trauma that they've been through for the yeah. fact that they're still alive, it's amazing. Mm-hmm. It yeah. is. Yeah. And despite carrying a death wish, you know, you're still alive. You're a warrior really deeply even though if you self-harm every day and you want to kill yourself every day the fact that you're still here it's amazing and it's such a gift to the world it is yes I, you reminded me of something that i am um, studied uh, uh doing research into lately about empathy mm-hmm. so i think it's such another controversial topic which is bpd and empathy there would be many research and probably a lot of uh, people say horrible things in forums to say people with BPD have no empathy. But mm-hmm. then there are also another side where a lot of people with BPD is highly sensitive and empathic. So no one knows what that is about. I've been thinking a lot about this and I found some answers. I know this is your interview, but I feel a bit excited about this. So Go know, ahead. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, cur- I'm yeah. curious to know what you found out. I personally never really look very deeply into it. I wrote an article before about the gifts of BPD and I do talk about them being empathic and things, but I didn't have a lot of solid evidence apart from one or two research papers. So I do get people saying, you're horrible, why are you saying this? Mm -hmm. You know, my Mm -hmm. wife has BPD, she's got no empathy. So here's the thing. I'm (laughs) going to go on on for another five minutes. So there are two, (laughs) you might know, there are two kinds of empathy. One is emotional empathy, where Mm -hmm. it's fired by our mirror neurons, where if you see someone in pain, you automatically feel pain. It's hardwired into us. So that's emotional empathy. And then there's one thing called cognitive empathy, which is related to mentalizing, which is perspective taking, where you Mm -hmm. kind of think about why the other person is doing what they do here is the thing i found and i need to find more research to back up what i'm saying but i saw one or two articles and i think it's so right this this are some this hypothesis people with a lot of people who ended up getting diagnosis uh getting the diagnosis of bpd uh have very mm, sensitive nervous system and they Mm. actually are innately very emotionally empathic so they catch on emotions very easily. They're quite susceptible yep. to emotional contagions. So if they yep. see someone in pain, you'll feel a lot of pain. It's a spectrum, right? Some people will be like, mm-hmm. ouch. But like some people, oh my God, I see her animals hurting and I start crying. <laughs> so that's yeah. what they call empath these days. And I think a lot of people with BPD probably uh, have a very high degree of emotional empathy. However, mm-hmm. I think when they are dysregulated, as because mood swings is a part of it, they lose the ability to mentalize, which is the cognitive yeah. side. So they lose the ability to think through, oh, why is my boyfriend cold to me today? Maybe he has got something at work. Maybe he's not feeling very well. They lose that ability to take the other person's perspective and they become very concrete. They talk about mm-hmm. it in mentalization where uh, psychic equivalents, if they have got term for it, where things become very concrete, which is like, oh, if he looks like he doesn't like me because he has a cold, bitchy face he must hate me (laughs) and then that becomes the reality so it would look as though they've lost the ability to empathize because they've lost the cognitive empathy at that moment when they lose Mm. affect regulation sorry so no that no 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 but that seems very accurate and very Mm. true I think that when anyone is dysregulated you're not able to mentalize anything Exactly. Why? It's because we're, our nervous system is activated and everything is firing. Something is wrong. Something, there's a threat nearby. Why would you then be able to rationalize exactly. as to what is going on? Yeah. And, and I also regrets. think that, yeah. And there is a big overlap, right? Between narcissistic personality disorder and borderline. And so sometimes people, and I've heard this so many times, people will describe someone to me as having BPD. And when I'm listening to them, and then I need to correct them. No, you're actually describing NPD. This is not BPD. There is a misconception in society that the two traits are mixed up, often Mm. conjoined together. And so people then, this adds to this fuel that folks who have BPD are not empathetic or not compassionate, but they're actually describing someone who has NPD. 
And as I mentioned, it's not a clear box, right? You yeah. could have someone who has different traits, different combinations from different personality, especially that they're all in the same cluster. It's very common to have a sprinkle of this and a sprinkle of that and a dash of this mm -hmm. to make up this person who is way more complex than just BPD, NPD, mm -hmm. histrionic personality disorder. It's no, we, there's a bit of everything. And yes. so this makes it so that it's hard sometimes maybe to be empathetic because there's a stronger lenience towards narcissistic traits with underlying borderline traits. But when people look at this person, they see them as BPD. Mm. What I also read about this whole empathy paradox is people with NPD, again, the myth, the society myth is they don't have empathy. So they're like mm, kind of mm -hmm. psychopathic. They're not able to yeah. empathize. What, what some research found is that actually that's not true. They have no. got a high degree of cognitive empathy, which means yeah. they can guess like, oh, you know, what's going on with the other person. They can mentalize and then they may maliciously use it. Mm hmm and people with BPD is kind of the opposite in a way. Exactly. Where exactly. they can't help, but they emotionally feel other people's pains, but they lose the ability to cognitively perspective take. Whereas people with NPD can take the other person's perspective and then they may do something with it. Exactly. And if you have someone who displays a semblance of both traits, mm. you it could look like someone who is very emotionally empathetic. And when they're not activated then they have more of this tendency to be cognitive cognitively empathetic but then if they have narcissistic traits we'll use that against others and so it's very complex and i think that's why the research there's so much contradictorial information out there but you're right to say that this model this way of conceptualizing it makes complete sense to me mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. oh my god it's um Thank you. I don't have anyone to talk to about these things that I've read. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I want to be respectful of your time. So we may not be able to go through everything, but mm -hmm. I, I'm, I want to cycle back to your personal journey and where you are at. I think some people might, I know a lot of people with BPC are also interested in getting on the same path. Mm -hmm. But many of them would get a huge imposter syndrome or thinking that, oh, you know, if that's not possible for me anymore, I've got this highly stigmatized diagnosis. Um, so if the question is whether or not someone who has had BPD and have recovered can become a therapist, or actually if they do have an active diagnosis, what would you suggest for them? Um, I think it's very much possible. And even for me, it's it's not to say... It's a weird thing with BPD also, even the term recovering from it, it makes it seem that as though it's a kind of disease and it, that sometimes can be weird. I, I think that we have a long way to go in terms of terminology when it comes to BPD, uh, whether that's recovery or whatever the words that we use for it, because I definitely as an individual still have moments and traits and instances where I get into these shame spirals and all the things and that's okay I'm human and it's not because I have BPD specifically it's just because there's moments that are maybe amplified by the fact that I am more sensitive and so I would say that if there's individuals out there who are looking to go into this field don't be scared by this diagnosis don't be scared by the labels and the stigma. And it's really important to go through your own process of therapy so that you can acquire skills and understanding and more acceptance of who you are mm -hmm. to use those things. As I had mentioned earlier, it's in the beginning stages where we tend to shy away from this. That's when it's important to just go all in into it, lean into the discomfort, integrate those parts of yourself so that you can use those as a gift for your own clients. And when I started my program, my master's program, I actually got diagnosed a month later. So it was during my whole master's program that I was going through my own process of the DBT program, individual therapy. I think that I do have an advantage because if you look at the spectrum, I wasn't as far deep as some other people. And so it was easier for me than maybe someone else who is further along the spectrum of having BPD traits to 
acquire new skills and to change radically in my own life, I felt very well equipped and supported to be able to take on that endeavor. So I would say it's really important to know yourself, to make sure that you're well supported because it's impossible to do this by yourself. You really need people who love you Mm. and who can help to burden the weight a little bit because you've been doing it on your own for so long, Let others help you. And yeah, the main thing is really just to go make sure that you're going through your own therapy process to get the help that you need so that when you finally start to see clients, you're at least better equipped and that you know yourself and your blind spots, because the worst thing you can do is go into this profession blindly, having all these triggers, going into sessions, being really triggered. And then there's transference that happens that you put that onto your clients, which is the last thing that they need. Indeed. Yes. Yes. Can't agree more. And thank you for an encouraging statements one thing i love when i saw your channel i think remember you saying something it's a it's an i correct me if i butchered you it's a diagnosis not an identity exactly so beautifully said like i would say that analogy to people like okay let's say you have flu you don't just become Mm -hmm. a flu person for the rest of your life you had the flu you've recovered so you don't have to carry the flu identity forever no. It's a bit more complex with PD, especially that it's called personality disorder. Mm-hmm. But you, you don't have to carry that forever. Mm. No. And you can start to see it as something beautiful. Yeah. I'm always going to be someone who is a bit more sensitive and probably anxious than someone else. And that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. Totally. It's just about recognizing it, knowing it, and knowing how to be able to take care of myself in those moments where I need that extra boost. But if you're so scared of knowing those things about yourself and not willing to accept them, that's where problems come in. Because then you're fighting against yourself to just rather than saying, you know what, I'm sensitive. That makes it so that I'm more nurturing and compassionate and all those beautiful things. And that's thankfully where I am today. Like I said, I still have moments of being down on myself and that's okay. And it is important for people to know that, that I don't want anyone to ever watch my videos or listen to anything that I say and think, oh, she's doing so well and look at her go and Mm -hmm. she's living her best life. No, Mm -hmm. with BPD, there's this black and white (laughs) way of thinking It's not because I'm here today that my life is peachy and roses. It means that I'm, what they're not seeing is me striving every single day, waking up and making that conscious effort to be a better version of myself. And that's what people who have BPD need to realize. It's, it's an everyday choice and process. It's a moment to moment choice. Do I choose to go into these patterns that are comfortable and ineffective? Or do I choose to go against this natural tendency and do something brave and courageous for myself? That's where we want to strive for. I always tell my clients, it's not about the outcome. It's about the process. As long as you're trying and you're showing up for yourself, it's all you can ask for. Thank you. And thank you for showing up. Mm -hmm. I am extremely passionate about helping people coming out as who they are. And if you are sensitive, yes, own that. You just move out Mm -hmm. of the diagnostic, you know, you're no longer manifesting, going back to our conversation, the shadow side of your personality, but rather you can manifest the strength side. Still the same person. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you so much. I have really enjoyed this conversation and I talk more. So have I. (laughs) (laughs) No, I've learned a lot and I definitely you left me with some things to think about. So thank you. Thank you. Finally, um, any particular resources that you would recommend to people? Maybe therapies that you would recommend, or even just a website or books or your channel. Yeah, definitely my channel, but uh, I would say self-compassion is the best, the best thing ever. So just checking out Kristen Neff, she has a website where she has a bunch of exercises, uh, recorded guided meditations. Self-compassion is a really good place to start. If you don't know where to start today, you can do that. Everything is very comprehensive on your website and she has books and videos and everything that can help you start that process of essentially reparenting yourself so that you can feel more secure with yourself and in turn with others. Thank you so much. And I will certainly direct people to your channel. Yes, thank you. 
Thank you. I hope we will speak again. Hey, thank you so much for tuning in. For more, please head to eggshelltherapy.com. There you will find more stories, articles, and resources for people just like me and you. Bye now. Keep putting one foot in front of the other. Moving forwards, never looking back. Just one more foot in front of all those countless others. And we're there.